Gerstein, what other cancers do we see with nets that occur simultaneously with nets? Well, that's a good question, and the answer to that question is... Anybody seen Dr. Liu? Where did he Just go? because you have one cancer doesn't mean you can't get another. So I advise all my patients to be vigilant about all the recommended routine screenings. All my women patients should get mammographies. All my patients should continue to get their colonoscopies and continue their screaming. You can see a variety of different uh, cancers with nets. Uh, Ed, you have a comment? Just a quick comment. It looks like many types of cancer are significantly increased in neuroendocrine uh, cancer yeah. patients. We see a lot of people with breast cancer. I have over 30 patients that I've seen with breast cancer and neuroendocrine cancer at the same time. We see patients with kidney cancer and neuroendocrine tumors. We see people with colon cancer and neuroendocrine tumors with increased frequencies with these other diseases, even when there aren't other risk factors. So they, people should like women who have breast cancer. One in eight women get breast cancer. You're telling me that it's go, it's one in four, one in six. We, we, we don't have good statistics, but no, there's a, a no. feeling right now no. that it's higher than normal. There's several. Odo, didn't you study this? Yes. Uh, about, uh, for the Virginia meetings, we, uh, we reviewed it. One of the best was uh, there were five international uh, or five international countries, five countries that came together with a, a, with a very large uh, uh, a secondary primary malignancy, uh, which is what you're talking about, when the primary is small bowel. That was done for small bowel. And interestingly, and this is what we tend to see, uh, in our practice, uh, about there three were the years two, worth of questions. Yeah, there are two. Okay, <laughs> so the two, the two types of cancer uh, was the the, uh, the colon and the uh, colorectal, and the other was uh, thyroid of interest. And the most expensive test to make the diagnosis turned out to be uh, Octrea scan was picking them up uh, as nodules. Uh, and I think we've, we, uh, we would say those are the two predominant ones in the experience, and that's the one that the international uh, said were the two top. I, we were surprised. So I think maybe it's changing a little bit or observations more closely. Uh, okay. But I think secondary primary malignancies, as Hal said, is very, uh, it's about 18%, you think, those numbers are real? Yeah, and one more comment is that especially in uh, poorly differentiated uh, nets, these, these tumors have a high... Um, uh, um, Guys, we can stop with the questions. We got about three, <laughs> three weeks worth of questions. These patients have a high mutation rate, a high mutation index. Four weeks. And um, breast cancer patients have a high mutation index. Um, uh, melanoma patients have a high mutation index. So these patients are not only um, can be more sensitive to immuno immuno-oncology techniques, they may be also uh, related. Okay, Dr. Liu, I have uh, hypothyroidism, hyperaldosteronism, parathyroid tumor benign, infertility, et cetera. Do, am I an MEN1 or an MEN2 or an MENX or, or none of the above? Well, the first thing I would do is refer you to Dr. Odoricio. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Odo, uh, is there a magic hyperaldo part of an MEN? I've never heard of it. No, I haven't. Okay. All right. What's the therapeutic dose for sandostatin? 30 or 60 milligrams. The FDA approved dose is 30. It's interesting. The FDA, of course, when they start doing new trials, are requiring a higher dose, yeah. 60 milligrams. Odo and I and Dr. Vinnick and, and all have published a number of papers showing that to get saturation of the somatostatin receptor subtype 2, it takes 60 milligrams, but not at one time. Remember, there's a humpogram, day 0, day 14, day 28. If you put twice as much in, you go at day 14 twice as high. Whereas if you do it every 14 days, it makes it a very smooth curve. Dr. Oberg likes to give 90 milligrams, but only people who have three butt cheeks. Three <laughs> butt cheeks. And Dr. Oberg will be the first one to tell you that if he really had 
his druthers, there's a, another somatostatin analog in Europe that he tried that was 180 milligrams a day, or 180 milligrams a month, I'm sorry, that really kicked butt and take names for uh, yeah. anti-tumor effect. That was called Oncolar. Oncolar, yeah, that's but, right. But, yeah. but I, just, I just want to make a comment on the dosing. Um, yes, the FDA approves 30 milligrams every 28 days. Most, most payers will allow a higher dose but not a shorter interval, which is a problem. Mm -hmm. I do have a problem. Interestingly enough, about that. three quarters of the patients that I see from New York are on 40 milligrams every 21 days. So it's, yeah. a, it's a really sort it's of- a, It's a problem. Medicare it, will not pay for that. Um, actually, Medicare is paying for that. Not in New York. Not in New York? Okay. They send them all to us. Okay, uh, hypothetically, if a patient was to heed and, and have all therapies, PRT, MIBG, chemo, radiation, what would be the order uh, in having therapies so to prevent cutting you off from other therapies yeah. down the road? That's, uh, that's a good question. Yeah. Sequence of therapies is really critical. The one, th one point I would add is we don't use spheres, radioactive spheres, and then follow it by PRT yeah. or PRT followed by spheres. Yeah. That's the only thing I can tell you out of that group that I think it excludes another therapy. Yeah. Tom? So I, we agree with that, and in in, I, I mentioned it, but uh, both Basel and Bod Burka now are actually saying uh, because of the, uh, the uh, distortion of uh, HAE, uh, and they, they, they tend to recommend holding off until PRT for even bland embolization. That's one thing. The other is the, uh, what, what condition the, the, the blood components are going to be in, like we call it pr bridging, bridging with uh, Affinitor or bridging with CAPTEM uh, combinations. And, and that may be a bit of a problem if you're planning PRT, but at the same time, you have to weigh that against the kind of progression that you might be undergoing while you're waiting. I think that's going to reduce itself because I think as uh, PRT comes in the United States as, as, a, as a recognized therapy, there won't be this agonizing type of bridging that we ha have to undergo uh, before PRT. But you okay. try. Uh, comparison of Lanreotide 120 versus uh, LAR60. Uh, what does it take to get saturation levels for each drug for somatostatin receptor subtype 2? Think again, uh, Odo and myself and Vinick and Go wrote uh, a paper on 60 milligrams of LAR getting you to saturation. Uh, 240 of lanreotide gets you to saturation uh, in, in, in another manuscript using both the ISI assays. And, and I think the dose is about, uh, the level should be, I think, between nine and, uh, ideally, Gene said, uh, five to 10,000 picograms per mil, but, but if you get around seven to uh, 11 or 12, I think. Uh, I think that's right. Uh, anybody using CyberKnife as part of the routine care of these people? We, brain mets, uh, a, a tricky bone met, May occasionally that's like in the spine right up against the cord, something like that. But in general, CyberKnife is, is not a, an effective therapy. External beam radiation is not a big therapy. In your yeah, and, and occasionally you, you have to radiate externally a beam or radiate somebody. I have a patient that I treated in Oregon that Rod Pommier just sent me his picture. He's 35 years, but now he's had, uh, 35 years out still alive, we did great from that perspective, but now his abdomen is a disaster from the radiation therapy. Is PRT more effective on the liver than other parts of the body? I don't think so. Uh, bone, uh, bone mets, less response bone met wise, uh, but you know, I gotta tell you, and, and I wish Dr. Campo was here to comment on with Zometa, vitamin C, vitamin D, we just don't see progression of bone meds. No, and I think the other point was brought up by Hal and Ed, and that is the, uh, the, our immune system just doesn't recognize uh, the tumors. And so if you look, there's one series of about 600 patients. It was retrospective, 
but bones don't generally fracture. They're, they can be painful, but you don't see pathological fractures uh, usually. Uh, I think I think radiate, the lutetium may be a little bit better. I don't know, but then the yttrium for bone mets. It's hard to say. Okay, uh, Eric, the awful, the brutal, and tenacious. Uh, if you've ever heard the Ray Stevens song. Uh, news on the oncolytic virus trial from Sweden. You, you, of anybody ought to know. Sure, I can explain. So, um, just so everyone knows, Dr. Oberg, who is a, a, a real uh, giant in the field of neuroendocrine from, from Uppsala, Sweden, he and his colleagues have developed this oncolytic virus. And basically what it is, it's kind of, it's super engineered specifically for neuroendocrine tumors. It comes in two phases. Everyone's been asking me. It comes in two phases. The first phase was mandated by the government to only include Swedes. So they got to get through 12 patients and get them treated and find the right dose. He's treated at least two so far as, as of last month and a half. He's treated two so far, and they've all tolerated the medication very, very well. So it's kind of in the process. So hopefully in a year or so, once they get through, it'll be good. More, more available, more open. Had any tumor responses? Uh, they haven't gotten that far. They've only kind of given it. Okay. They're looking for safety and stuff like that. Uh, so the octreotide it. pump yeah. advantages. How do you get a pump, Odo? Yeah. What's its cost? How do you cost? get a pump, Odo? I'd like to know. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, insurance coverage, disadvantages, uh, and polymers, are they, are they endocrine disruptors? Like, is polyglycolic acid a polymer? Uh, a bad thing to have in LAR would you be are you better off with the nanotube uh, with lanreotide but let's go back to the pump how do you get a pump how do you use the pump and are there any disadvantages to a pump so in the latter part with the smaller models of the uh, insulin subcutaneous insulin infusion pumps the, the, that the the downside of wearing them in that is really not a problem the uh, the one company that came out was Animus was the was the one that really led it and accepted octreotide. Uh, it, it almost varies from from sub company to sub company. It, it, we have the we have the the address. Uh, Kim, our our uh, nurse manager, has that. We could provide uh, that. Uh, and there is it's a very simple thing it usually achieves levels within three days i mean and you can adjust it by half units and and it's uh, remarkably consistent uh in terms of achieving you get a lot more uh, higher levels with a lot less drug and for those of you who don't know there's a lady in this audience georgia Beauchemin, who is the queen of pumps she okay. knows everything there is to know there about a pump Good. how to get it how to wear it how to adjust it how to get it fixed, how to trade it in on a new one, mm -hmm. et cetera. Oh, and, and her email is ageofpurple at aol.com. She's who I use when I don't know the answer. Well, the challenge is the insurance, though. Yeah, the, the insurance. insurance. The, and is, if your insurance covers sub-Q uh, octreotide, you have a good chance of getting it covered, and that's true. Still runs about $6,000 for the pump. You can rent or buy, but the uh, but the um, uh, the supplies vary from 100 to 150 dollars for three months because you change the catheter usually every. Yeah, three but days. I mean, let's yeah, face it, guys, 150 dollars every three months, and one shot of LAR is in my institution 14 grand. Give me a break, that's a deal of the century. Uh, since gallium 68 is is non-revealing bone mets in many of us that were not detected on other images, what do you do with this new information? Um, you want to speak to how, do you use a gallium scan in people whose conventional imaging is all negative, or do you use gallium scan to define the extent of disease right, right. in somebody who has at least one lesion on conventional image. Right, right. So what Dr. Walter This is important. This yeah. is the take home message of the night. Yeah, this is actually really important. So the gallium scan is a very important tool. But you have to know what disease you're using it for, okay? And this is this is the important thing. And uh, cuz the three of us talk about this pretty frequently. In general, if a patient has some identified tumor on cross-sectional imaging, MRI, CT, whatever it is, like a, like a, a, a quote-unquote real tumor, okay? On conventional On conventional imaging. black and white imaging you can find the other stuff. You can find the bone mets like you had asked. However, 
the majority of the patients who have something called carcinoid complex, you know, created by this young, this young man over here, in which they have disease, I'm sorry, if they have symptoms out of proportion to disease, because you know, if we can't find any tumors, they just have a bunch of symptoms, um, then usually the gallium is not very helpful because they usually don't have a cancer disease. Does so that make if sense? It, yeah. let me see if I can paraphrase the take home message. If conventional imaging is all negative, gallium scan doesn't help you. Usually doesn't find anything. Usually doesn't have find anything. Right, if conventional imaging finds anything, gallium finds a lot more anything. Right. Yeah. In fact, we talked about this before, and we've uh, between uh, between the Iowa group and, and when I used to be at Vanderbilt, we looked for a lot of patients who had unknown primary, like tons of symptoms and unknown primary. I never found one. I don't think right. you guys found one. And in UC, at UCLA, we had 100 patients that were scanned with gallium uh, dotate, and it still was the same result, that it right. changed management in 60% of the cases where we did a gallium scan. It's a great test, but for finding disease when there's no detectable cancer in the body, and, it's and not it's, worth it. it. It's interesting. We were all talking amongst ourselves about the dilemma this is going to put on the hospitals. Your hospital is not going to be able to do 100 gallium scans a week. So if you have a very busy clinic like Eric or, or Tom or, or Hal or uh, uh, Sue or uh, Ed, uh, I don't know how many PET scans a single institution. Can you take over a PET scanner to do five PET scans or six PET scans a day, five days a week, and let nobody else in the hospital have that PET scanner? Trust me, that ain't going to fly very well. Yeah, let me make the distinction be for, for everybody out there between an anatomic scan and a functional scan. Yeah. Okay, and it's a very important that you guys understand that. An anatomic scan, like a CAT scan or an MRI, will tell you if there's something there. And the resolution, the, the, the degree of how, how small uh, a, a growth it can pick up is very, very important. Those scans will tell you if something's there or not there won't tell you what it is and won't tell you if it's doing anything. It'll just tell you if it's there or not there. The gallium is a functional scan like the Octrea scan, a functional scan, will tell you if this tissue is functioning and what it's doing. Yeah, and that's okay. very, very important. Right. It's like color on top of a black and white image. If you watch black and white, sure, you can see John F. Kennedy give a lecture. But it'd be nice to see him in color. You know Sue, you got something to say? Well, I'll just say that we, uh, consider, I want to tell you what we consider as conventional imaging. Uh, it's like Hal said, it, you need a high resolution CT, not just the little CT that we do with a PET scan. Uh, you, they can see one to two millimeters. A PET scan, whether it's gallium or it's FDG, can see about three millimeters, and the Octrea scan can see one to two centimeters. Right. Maybe. So, Maybe. so you're looking at it, and when you talk about bone disease, there are not very many of those that are that are that big. So it's very nice to be able to see them on a bone scan, on a, on an MRI or a CT before you try to look for them functionally. Okay, Sue, the, you, we got you on the hook. You mentioned having more data on bone marrow toxicity, but not a tough time to present it in your presentation. Will you please share more data with us now? The uh, incidence of uh, bone marrow toxicity that is unrecoverable is very small. It's less than 1% of all patients who receive PRRT. The incidence of people having bone marrow toxicity, that means temporarily their lymphocytes decrease is very high, but they recover in the six weeks time between, or eight weeks time between the cycles. Okay. So in that way it's like uh, chemotherapy. So then I have a question for you. If it's recoverable for the most part, why can't you use liver directed spheres after? The, because it's the normal disease, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and you have no idea what, what dose you gave to the normal liver, because they don't do dosimetry. If they did dosimetry, you'd be in fat city. Oh, but all they do is biodistribution. 
That's the problem. And we actually uh, looked... So it's not the bone marrow reserve you wor worried about. It's the liver toxicity. It's the, li it's it's the both, liver it's toxicity. It's These we people develop cirrhosis, societies, liver failure, right. uh, and, and they lose weight, mm -hmm. they lose their synthetic function. Wait, but, but before we totally you know, badmouth that therapy, you have to understand, I think in, in very experienced hands, it's a very important tool to have in the toolbox. So, for example, I have, I be, I'm very blessed. I work with a very gifted interventional radiologist named Charlie Nutting, and he will dose adjust a fair amount, kind of like this image, not exactly perfectly, but with it, he'll dose adjust to try to reduce that rate of, of, of liver failure. So there's still experience still goes a long ways. Uh, and we actually looked uh, at the liver in some of our early studies, and when people had a lot of liver disease, the total liver uh, actually got a lot more than in the first cycle than they did in the second and third cycles when the actual tumor had, 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 had decreased in size. So I think the idea of just doing dosimetry once when you get your first cycle isn't enough. We've found that you have to do it uh, more than once in order to see the change in what's going to be taken up by the kidney or the liver. Okay, Sue, you, boy, you're on a hot roll here. They love you. Uh, <laughs> I, I, yeah, well, that's a fact. Uh, <laughs> nobody likes Odo, though. Just, just Sue. And not when he's, Sue's a not nice. When he's light, except yeah, Sue. But she likes him, so we put up with it. Okay, I, apparently a patient's thinking about getting PRT, and his kidneys have sort of gotten zapped over the time. What are the creatinine cutoffs, the GFR cutoffs, i.e., how bad can my kidneys get and still get PRT? We um, look at both your creatinine, and if your creatinine uh, is low, we actually do a functional study to look at what your creatinine clearance is. Uh, the creatinine clearance is a uh, nuclear medicine scan itself, but it can look at each kidney individually and tell you how well uh, so what's working. the cutoff? So creatinine. the cutoff for creatinine uh, in our studies is 1.2, or you know that you all, we all have less kidney function as we age, so there are uh, age delimited. What about size? I mean, big guys have higher creatinines normally than little teeny tiny people. Yeah, it, we regulate it by age and, 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 and sex. And sex, actually. okay. Uh, okay, Eric the Awful. Uh, several lung noids have had some great improvement from the treatment with uh, Pivido, the new lung cancer drug. Optiva. Octiva. Oh, yeah. Oh. How effective is it? Uh, and is hemp oil effective against carcinoid cancer? <laughs> hemp oil, is that because I live in Colorado, is that why? Yeah, <laughs> that's a good one for you. Yeah, I know. I, I will answer the hemp part of it, how about that? And I'll let Hal and uh, Ed answer the uh, Optiva part. So um, I have uh, strong feelings about marijuana because um, obviously it's a little more available where I live. And I have certainly found, I have not found, just in my observations, there's no clinical trial, but that I've not found it to, to make the, t the tumors go away or, or cure anyone of their cancer. Yeah. But it certainly helps a lot with symptoms and sleep and appetite and those kinds of things and pain management. And in general, if I can get people off of opiates, it's a, it's a better place for them and they can function better. So, so for symptomatic and kind of quality of life purposes, there is a significant benefit for it. Ed, you want to talk about hemp? You then want to talk about Activa? I think we've heard about hemp. The situation with Activa, that's the same as the pembrolizumab I was talking about before, immune checkpoint inhibitor, and the keynote trial and the trials I was discussing showing tremendous response in high-grade neuroendocrine tumor of lung, very, very active in that setting in um, carcinoid and atypical carcinoid of the lung trials are now being started and we don't have information yet, but we're hopeful. Yes. Okay. Let, me, uh, uh, let me make a quick comment on that and I, I agree with that completely. Um, the anaplastic and high grade uh, uh, lung noids uh, do respond beautifully to um, the um, uh, either Optiva or Keytruda and um, you know, much has been said about measuring the PDL1 levels 
uh, on the tumor before uh, you start patients on these treatments. And I have to say that they're very unreliable, in my opinion, and they really don't correlate well at all. There's much more talk now, as I briefly mentioned, about a mutation index, and uh, you can actually get that test as well on, on the uh, tumors by the same people that do the pdl one And that might correlate a lot better with response. Yeah, I agree completely. Uh, just a comment from the prior uh, query about creatinine. The Lutathera netter uh, cutoff is 1.7 creatinine and, a G and or a GFR of greater than 50. So uh, ours, ours, our protocol is a little more stringent, but we do the adjustments, so it does it Better does take Better not in kill more. people early on. Yeah. Yeah. No, ex expanded access the same, 1.7. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to be overly cautious or in early stage disease or early stage trials. How? Suma patient has had several different chemos. He's failed ultimately, and he wants to go back and try an earlier chemo, which had originally had success. Is that a reasonable way to go? Once, once you're resistant to a chemo, are you always resistant? That's a great question. And uh, in general, the answer to that is yes. But depending on the, what we call the performance status of, of the patient, if a patient's fit and uh, uh, well enough to undergo more chemo and have, if that was effective in the past and you want to try it again and we're out of all other options, I would say it's acceptable to try it. But I might go on to more, um, more um, uh, innovative therapies like the immunotherapy at that point. Dr. Wallen, talk about the optimal chemo sequence. <laughs> the optimal sequence of treatments, whether it's uh, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, clinical trials, interferon, immune treatments of different kinds, everolimus, unitinib, you name it. Lanreotide, octreotide, it all depends on the clinical situation. And the, what I mean by it's that the is the difference between the science of medicine and, and the, the art, art of and the medicine. art of medicine. And the things that we use to that's make why you go to a specialist like you. You don't you don't go to a guy who's seen one neuroendocrine tumor patient in his life. So the things that make the decision are number one, how fast is the cancer growing? Is it a very very slow disease, increasing slowly where you could watch it without any therapy, you could use a somatostatin analog for many, many years before anything more toxic is needed on one hand, or is it a fast-growing cancer, the extreme case being so fast it needs chemo, and an intermediate case where you use different kinds of biologic drugs, okay? Is it confined to the liver, or is it metastatic all over the body? If it's confined to the liver, you think very hard about multidisciplinary approaches to liver metastasis with ablation, embolization, resection, whatever. We have Okay, PRT. we got five minutes left. Okay, go for See the question. list. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so no BS. We gotta fly. Yes or no. Okay. okay. Yes or no. Should any chemo be afford, uh, avoided if you're diabetic and you're a peanut? Streptozytosin, would you avoid that? If you're diabetic? Or you just give them insulin and say the hell with it? Nor normally, you have to make a decision, and if uh, the cancer is more threatening than the diabetes, you give more insulin and give the medicine you need to. Okay. Uh, we'll give you this one again. Uh, if a net spread from small bowel to liver and pancreas, it's probably not pancreas, it's probably the root of the mesentery, what treatment might be considered best excluding surgery? Uh, my, my take what? is, uh, yeah, well, that's sort of like saying, you know, I'm pregnant or something like that, anyhow. Uh, <laughs> surgery, surgery, surgery is the best therapy. If, if you can't have, if you won't have surgery, you could consider PRT, you could consider chemotherapy, you could consider Affinitor, you could consider a lot of different therapies, they clearly be suboptimal. Dr. Liu, does lanreotide also help reduce symptoms of diarrhea in flushing, or is it only designed to decrease tumor size? No, 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 no. It, it helps with symptoms too. I, I tried. I, I tried to show that it was a little more complicated, but it does. It does help with symptoms. Remember, they're they're sister drugs. Biologically, Just, they have very similar. Activity. Remember what really happened. Novartis got approved for symptoms based on anecdotal evidence 
from Dr. Odoricio, from Dr. Coles, et cetera. There wasn't a clinical trial way back when. They approved it very, very rapidly, and it was for only symptom control of the massive diarrhea of carcinoid and vipoma. Then uh, Ibsen came along, and they saw an opportunity because the, we all knew, everybody knew who used the drug that, that it had an anti-tumor effect. So Ibsen hopped on that bandwagon like a frog on a bug and said, we're going to get our approval different, uh, for different reasons than, than uh, the Novartis uh, the, the, the group. Yeah. It was so, a but, but they both, uh, they're, they're like brothers. They really are. They, they, they're just equally uh, have the same effect on tumor and symptoms. There's a little bit better, I think, blood level with, uh, with the somatic. Oh, they're like sisters. They're both sisters. beautiful and they're both jealous. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. And like your wives. Yeah. That's right. That's yeah, your wives. So yeah. it was a, the FDA. Sue Odoricio, yeah. we, will your continuing efforts in the yttrium lutetium research space also look into the effect of yttrium lutetium therapy on immunological fallout, i.e. tumor immunology, and the case of residual tumor post-treatment? Actually, the uh, uh, I had a slide I didn't have time to show. Uh, some of the next combinations that, that are going to come in are going to be uh, lutetium plus uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors or uh, yttrium 90 plus immune check mm -hmm. inhibitors. And I think they're going to work very well together. Right, we're collaborating and developing such a trial, which hopefully will be active by early next year. Perfect. So when uh, I said, is the magic bullet here yet? It, it's when it's I was, I was specifically Maybe we just have referring to the checkpoint inhibitors, and they may be eventually the magic bullet. Uh, if Yitcher 90 and Lutetium 177 are better together, uh, yeah. will the combination be approved in the U.S. in the near future? So, yeah, we'll <laughs> Actually, in the U.S., you have to prove each one separately first, and then be able to put them together. So we're working on uh, getting approval for the yttrium 90, and then we'll be able to work with AAA to, Two try to get them, them to, yes. to use them together. We, we have to. Dr. Liu, do all the patients undergo somatostatin therapy? Two minutes to go. Eh, it depends. It depends. Okay. Uh, I'm on a somatostatin regimen. Do I have to be careful with exposure to young children, elderly, etc., when you have an Octrea scan? No. Oh, actually, uh, scan. No, in general, no. Okay. Uh, just, you know, if you're really worried about a young child, just don't sleep with that child for the, uh, a day or well, really two. Don't yeah. 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 yeah, don't urinate on the child. That's and, a good idea. Uh, <laughs> and the, thing, and, and the other thing, too, the other thing, too, for yttrium 90 or lutetium 177, each state has different regulations, but remember it's beta energy. It, it, it goes less than three or four inches out. And in fact, it doesn't leave the body 99% of the time. So the restrictions are just what was being alluded to, and that is a urine collection, that sort of thing. But you go home the same day in Iowa from your treatment. Okay, Dr. Wallen, last question. Minute and 34 seconds left. I'm a mid-gut with liver mets. I have an SUV of 4.9%. Can I try Everolimus? The SUV of what? Uh, they didn't say. On a, on a, gallium, on a gallium scan or an FDG I guess pet? it must be a gallium scan. Uh, no. Everolimus is not related to the SUV of either one. Either. And I, I didn't that. think so. Okay, maybe we can get one more. Sue, are you saying that having both yttrium and lutetium uh, under and tumors under three centimeters works better than the lutetium alone. Yes, this has uh, been shown in both of them. Uh, and the, um, the other thing that's important is Thank you. that if you exceed, if you have yttrium 90, go to talk or tate, and then you progress, there's actually been a study which shows that you can go then to the other isotope and you can not only increase your time to survival, but you can increase the tumor kill as well. Ladies and gentlemen, as they say, I bid you a fond adieu for tonight. I hope you all had a wonderful day. Uh, Bob, I don't know if you're gonna say a few words.
but I personally thank you all for coming, and I hope it was everything you wanted it to be. Yeah, how about another hand? What a great afternoon panel, wasn't it?